Hello and welcome to the 15th episode of season three of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. This is the 79th episode of the show and the 56th regular episode. Today I'm joined by the first educational technology speaker that ever made me say, I will tune into anything that this guy does or says, Mr. Eric Kurtz himself. Eric and I will be talking about how students can show comprehension with visuals. We'll talk about a bunch of creative uses of Google Slides, Google Drawings, Google Docs, and Sheets, including stop-motion animation, choose-your-own-adventure activities, emoji learning activities, rebus stories, blackout poetry, and pixel art. We'll also talk about Canva for education and Adobe Spark for education. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so without further ado, let's get to it. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Heil, one of the hosts of the Partial Credit Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting educational podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast with Jake Miller. Welcome! What's up, duct tapers? For the returning listeners, welcome back. It's been a few weeks since a regular episode, and I'm so glad to be back with you. For our new friends, welcome in. I'm so glad to have you here with us. As most of you already know, my name is Jake, and I'm here to talk to you about duct tape and educational technology and how, in my silly mind, the two of them go together to form an ed tech integration mindset that I think that you can use in your learning environments now. I'm also here today to talk to one of the OGs, that's original gangstas of educational technology speaking, blogging, and awesomeness, Eric Kurtz. Seriously, as you'll hear me tell Eric in the interview, he's one of the very first educational technology speakers that I ever saw, and he was the first one that made me say, wow, this dude is good at this. I will attend all of his presentations. I will read all of his blogs. I will subscribe to all of his newsletters. I will watch all of his videos. Seriously, he's that good. And seriously, I said that when I first saw him speak, all of it. And I, I said it out loud in the middle of the session. It was awkward. He had to shush me so that he can continue presenting. <laughs> oh, Technically, there were educational technology speakers pounding the conference hall pavement before Eric, but he was the first one that really wowed me. And he does not disappoint in today's episode. He really brings the knowledge today and possibly inadvertently, he really brings the laughs as well. But before we get to chatting with Eric, a couple of things we got to go over. First, later in the episode, you'll hear two instances of what I like to call the adjacent possible. The adjacent possible is the idea that any evolution of anything, life, music, art, ideas, any of those evolutions are done in steps that are adjacent to the current step. So what's possible is impacted by what's adjacent to the current state. And this applies to our learning and growth as educators too. What we do in the future in our classrooms is impacted by what's adjacent to us now. And we can be deliberate about what we expose ourselves to. So I'm going to bring two new adjacent possibilities to you today. First up will be an audio message from Carmen Tatum. She'll be sharing an awesome activity that she did in class, and she shared it using my SpeakPipe page. So it's an audio message. And Carmen, you are the first SpeakPipe message. So I think you deserve a prize. Carmen, I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to send you a, a pile of educational duct tape swag. You'll hear about some of that educational duct tape swag later in the episode. But I'll send you a, a keychain and some pins and some stickers and maybe some GIF and GIF stickers for being the very first person to submit a SpeakPipe message. And you know what? I think this should now be a contest. I think the second person to submit a speak pipe message, either a question or some feedback or a share, whatever you want, uh, I'll give you the link here in a second. Second person will also get a prize just like Carmen. So Carmen, I'll talk to you later about making arrangements to send you that. That's some, some swag, some duct tape or swag. Anyhow, Carmen shared this message on the speak pipe page. So it's an audio message. I'll play it later during the celebration of the adjacent possible. And if you want to submit a voice message on speak pipe whether you're the second one or not and you win the prize or not you could do so too by going to speakpipe.com that's s-p-e-a-k like speaking and pipe like a pipe you're speaking through p-i-p 
S-A-P-E dot com slash E-D-U duct tape. And that link is always in the show notes there and ready for you. There will be a second thing in the celebration of the Jason Possible today, and that is a question that I'll be answering, and it came from Corey Colby. He asked this question about digital flashcards on Twitter, uh, and he got a slurry of answers. Slurry? Is slurry a word? Hold on. I got to double click, right click, define slurry. A semi liquid mixture, typically of fine particles. No, I don't think. Maybe I meant flurry. Did I mean a flurry of, of answers? A slew? Maybe I combined slew and flurry there. <laughs> <laughs> a small swirling mass of something. <laughs> yeah, I think he did get a flurry of answers, maybe. <laughs> Anyhow, Corey got a flurry of awesome answers, or a slew of them. I'm not sure which. Or a slurry, who knows? <laughs> Where am I getting my words from? <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to share my answers and other answers that people gave to Corey in that tweet uh, later in the episode about some digital flashcard options. And bam, that's the adjacent possible. Once you hear those things, they'll be added to your adjacent possible. Like, for example, I had never thought of doing what Carmen shares later. And in Corey's answer, I had a few answers, or Corey's question, I had a few answers in my mind, but other people shared things that I had either never heard of or had forgotten about, and they kind of added new things for me too, and they will for you as well. That's the adjacent possible. And if you've got a question that you'd like me or the duct tapers or all of us to answer, uh, I would love to address it on the show. You could tweet it to me at Jake Miller Tech. You could email it to me at Jake Miller Tech at gmail.com. You could submit it on the show's Flipgrid at flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape or submit a voice message on SpeakPipe like Carmen did at speakpipe.com slash edu duct tape. Those links are in the show notes. They're always in the show notes. Anyhow, however you do it, I'll pick one or two questions to ask at the tail end of most episodes. So ask them, and sooner or later, I promise to get them into an episode. Okay, next up, before we get to talking to Eric, actually, there's two things before I talk to Eric, but next up is a preview of where I'll be over the next few months. Within a few days of this episode airing, I'll be doing my second presentation as part of Spring Q. It's a session called a Perry Fun Pear Deck Intro with a focus on rapport building. Not gonna lie, or NGL, as the kids would say, I am super excited for this session because it's gonna be super fun. It's a brand new session. It's, it's, uh, something that I just decided recently to start doing, uh, and I'm really excited to do it. It'll be my first time doing it. I think it is going to be an absolute blast. And I've actually got some codes for, I think, three months of free premium access to Pear Deck that Pear Deck gave to me to share in that one. So be on the lookout for that if you're a Q attendee. Last week, we launched the ninth cohort of my virtual course called Best Practices and Tools for Learning in All Settings. It's too late to join that one now, but we've decided to add one last iteration of it, even though this one was supposed to be the last one. Actually, we're supposed to have that have had the last one multiple times now, and we're adding one more on. Cohort 10 will happen this summer. It'll be a seven-week experience that kicks off on June 20th and wraps up on August 10th. There's about two hours of work for each week of the course, but it's all asynchronous, so you could choose to do uh, choose when you do it. It'll come out two hours, like, like one chunk per week. So you can wait a few weeks and do like six hours all at one time, or you can do each two-week chunk as you go through the course. I have been so proud of the feedback that I've received for this course, but I've been even prouder of the educators that have participated in it. Uh, They've just done amazing things this school year and have done amazing things in the course that I've just been super, super excited about. You can get details for that final 10th summer cohort uh, at jakemiller.net slash KSU course 2020. And that link is in the show notes as well. Spring after that, aside from that, is a little slow for me in terms of presentations, but I will be making up for it and then some in June with a keynote at the Summit at Murray State, a keynote at WitCon, and a keynote at the Panhandle STEM Conference. I am super excited for these, and that's actually not all for June. There are a few other June and July events that are still in the works, but the ink hasn't quite dried on those ones yet, so I'll be sharing those in the future. So finally, if you've got an event coming up, I would love to be a part of it, whether it's on a stage or on a screen. My favorite thing to do is speak to and work with educators. So if you're planning an event, please head over to jakemiller.net slash speaking to see some speaking videos and to send me a message. 
Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me just grab my soapbox from over here. There we go. That's perfect. Climb up on there. So the Educational Duct Tape podcast and its accompanying hashtag, hashtag EDU Duct Tape, is so often spelled with a K in duct that today I'm going to go all ducky with this soapbox, and this time it's duck with a K. So one of the administrators at my school recently referenced a metaphor that struck me as thought-provoking. She compared educators, especially within the last year, to ducks. At first, I I was a little bit offended, maybe. (laughs) Um, But she said, we are calm, cool, and collected above the surface, but paddling like crazy under the water. First off, I agree with and love this metaphor. We typically look so composed to our students, their parents, and the people around us. Though we look composed, we may not feel composed or calm or cool or collected. We know how hard we're paddling and how many things are on our minds. It's really quite impressive that, just like a duck, we make it look easy, though that's far from the truth. Our relatively smooth glides through our educational responsibilities may be why some misguided members of our community and our society think teachers have it easy. They can't see how hard we're paddling. It's probably not wise to go all Daffy Duck or Donald Duck on them and give them an earful of quacks about how hard this is. But at least we can quack to each other about how hard we're working, right? It's important to let each other know that we're all paddling as hard as we can. You know, there are a few more duck features that remind me of educators. First off, the name duck came from the way that ducks feed. They quickly duck their head down into the water, get their food, and then pop back up. Teachers dive into their lesson planning, their skill learning, their ed tech integrating, and then pop back up to the surface looking calm, cool, and collected, ready to teach our learners. When they duck down for that food, they use a filtering mechanism that filters out the water while consuming the food. Educators are master filterers. What strategies are good? What activities are worthwhile? What educational technologies fit into our practices? Based on formative assessment data, what have we mastered? What needs revisited? Filter, filter, filter. Ducks also have really strong wings. Have you ever watched one fly? You can hear those wings flapping. It's like, it's crazy when they fly over my house. And they have really strong legs for that swimming. Those two things are our drive. That's our intrinsic motivation to get better and better every day for our learners. And finally, the most important two things, contrary to the urban legend, a duck's quack does echo. The knowledge that you share in your classrooms and the things that you say in your staff lounges and in your PLNs reverberate. And finally, we've all seen ducks with a line of ducklings following behind them in a single file line. Ducks are leaders, just like you. You lead, and what you do echoes. And I see you out there. I know how hard you're paddling right now. You know, she might not be a duck, but Dory had it right. Just keep swimming. You've got this. Quack. Today's guest. All right, today's guest is Eric Kurtz. Eric has been in education for 29 years and is currently a tech coach in Northeast Ohio and a Google for Education trainer and innovator. He shares all his ed tech resources through his blog at controlaltachieve.com and is the author of the book, Control Alt Achieve, Rebooting Your Classroom with Creative Google Projects. Again, you can find Eric at controlaltachieve.com or on Twitter at Eric Kurtz or on YouTube or Facebook or all of the places at Eric Kurtz. But where you can find him right now is right here in the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Eric, welcome in, man. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This is fantastic. Yeah, I feel like it's overdue. Eric and I live right down the street from each other, not literally, right down the highway from each other. Pretty close. <laughs> yes, in the, <laughs> yeah. in the same same section of the state as each other and have been seeing each other at tech conferences for yeah. nearly a decade. And yeah. I feel like this is, this is this is way overdue. Well, no, I, I really appreciate it. But yeah, I, I think there's something in the water here that uh, it uh, created the two of us. Yes, uh, well, but, a, lot, uh, a lot of awesomeness in Ohio with educational technology, right? Yeah, there really is. There really is. I can remember, Eric, our uh, one of my first ed tech conferences I ever went to. I was um, at my previous school district. I was still in the classroom. I hadn't even started tech coaching. And uh, I went to... I, 
think maybe it was a Google Summit or maybe it was Neotech. I'm really not sure what it was. It might have been the, the Neotech conference. And there was a conference or there was a, a session advertised called um, Paperless Classroom with Google Docs or something or other like that. And I was sure. like, that one sounds like a good one. And I went and that was my that was my very first Eric Kurtz experience. And I was like, this guy, <laughs> this guy is good. Where did this guy come from? <laughs> well, I always say I came from the classroom. I taught middle schoolers mathematics. And that was the trial by fire. If you can convince pubescent children that fractions are important, <laughs> then you can explain anything. And so that was where I uh, learned whatever presentation abilities I have was from the yeah. classroom. Yep. If you if you can handle middle schools, although it's funny, some middle school teachers are like, I can never stand up in front of adults and present something. They'll like ask me how I do it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, if you can handle the judgment of a 13 year old. <sighs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, but so you also have to make man. it fun. You know, I mean, it, you know, if you're if you're working with middle school students, you, you got to have fun with it. And we should carry those same things into working with adults. You know, yeah. it should be fun. It should be engaging. It should be exciting. That's for sure. I try to have yeah. fun every day. If, if I didn't, I don't know how I'd get by if I wasn't having fun in the classroom. Like I, can't, right. I just can't imagine not having fun when I can, squeezing it in there. So I got to tell you, Eric, I was, uh, we were schedu all scheduled for the interview tonight, and I had to text you and say, hey, I need an extra 10 minutes. I'm going to be late. And we were late because uh, my wife w was being adventurous in the kitchen and was trying a new recipe. She was trying TikTok pasta, oh. which I guess is a pasta recipe that was trending on TikTok. So it became... TikTok pasta. Ah. It was it was delicious and I but I started thinking like Eric certainly has never made TikTok pasta but Eric has made just about every meal I can imagine because I've been I've been following your Hello Fresh adventures or what, what whichever company you're using. Yeah, uh, I typically Home Chef, but I've done uh, Green Chef, I've done Purple Carrot. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> love those meal delivery kits. I'm still waiting for the for the invite when the, when, the, when the prosciutto's on or the risotto or I don't even know. I don't even know well, see, that's the thing. There's always two servings and there's and it's just me, you know, <laughs> making it. And so there's another there's another place at the table <laughs> if All you right, want to come ready. down the highway and join me. Uh, today was fish cakes and fish slaw. cakes. We had the fish cakes with like a sriracha type of a um, sauce and some slaw with pickled shallots. It was that delicious. sounds that sounds amazing. <laughs> it is. It's I sort know. of my um, it's my Zen time. It's nice. my time to slow down and say for the next, you know, I mean, they say it takes an, a half hour to cook these things. You know, I take longer. I just, I take the time, I cut everything, you know, I lay it all out, I cook, I enjoy it. It just, it's like, this is, this is my time. So I put on some music or I put on a show or something or a podcast and I, you know, cook and I, then I sit and I enjoy it. And it's really nice. It was too easy just to run through, you know, um, a drive through and grab things. And so a couple of, I don't know, maybe two years, probably been a year and a half, I started doing these yeah. meal kits and it's really helped a lot. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed seeing the pictures. And I'm surprised to hear that's your Zen thing, because here I thought your Zen was writing detailed blog posts on Google Apps for Education tools or Google Workspace tools or whatever. We or, no, it. I know. G Suite, you, I don't know what it's called next. You know, I heard it's official now. We got to call it Google Workspace for Education, right? Is that right? Well, yeah, but it also depends on then what um, what tier you right. end up buying into. You know, right. we are four different tiers now. And one of them is like, um, you know, Google Education Plus. So Google Plus is back. How about that? We thought it I was. Know that. Well, there's gone. a plus, but it's not the same plus, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I think it's coming back. I think, okay. <laughs> I think the king is dead. Long live the king. It's back. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no, okay. No, I'm no. ready. I'm ready to, to connect on Google plus that Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's gone. <laughs> I'll let it go. Okay. Well, it's a good but no, I do plus. enjoy writing blog posts very much. Yes. That is another thing that brings great joy to my life is being creative, coming up with neat ways to take the tools we have and do awesome stuff with them. So our kids can be creative. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Love it. Love it. And, you know, I got to say, uh, this is an unintentional plug here that just came up. I loved the way that the, the, the blog posts, I, 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 I've always admired how how thought out and clear your blog posts are, um, that, that somebody like myself who 
I, I'm good with educational technology. They that has all the information I need in there. But I also know when I think of the teachers that I work with who maybe are a little more you know nervous about using technology, that it also walks them through it. I've always admired the way you write those, and then seeing the way you paired those guides with you know, some of your anecdotes and some of your personal stories in the book, I, th yeah. I think was really well done. I think it was perfect for an educator like myself, who's already comfortable with the tools to get new ideas for how to use them, but also for somebody who's a little nervous about it. I think it came out really great. I really appreciate that. That's what I was certainly hoping. It's always meeting people where they're at and yeah. trying to bridge that gap. And yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, fantastic. I, I know it already says it on the back of the book that I think it's great, but I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's the mark of approval right there. Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, – yeah, right right on the back. Uh, you can't change your mind. You can't go back now. It's in print. It's, it, it is here. in print. Yes. Now it's in print and in audio. That, you know, you – yes. Yeah, so uh, there's no way you're getting out of it now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do solemnly swear. I'm just glad the that check like cleared the for the endorsement. So <laughs> right. Um, right. And you, I think you added it an extra zero onto it at the end of it, Eric. <laughs> yeah, but there was a decimal before it. So oh, yeah, it right. didn't really make a difference. Actually, there were, I noticed that there were three zeros after the decimal. What's up with that? I Scientific that accuracy, <laughs> just, you know, significant digits. Okay. <laughs> significant. The chemistry teachers are like, oh, okay. Yeah, the bio, yeah. Oh, who, no, yeah. I don't know who exactly. about the, yeah. the sig, sig digits there. <laughs> <laughs> math, math nerd, two math nerds enjoying ourselves, huh? Yeah. So even though we're already enjoying ourselves, Eric, we have to play a game. It's educational duct tape rules. Okay. Yeah, are you sure. up for a game? I am. Two truths and one lie. Let's start with a game of two truths and one lie. So you're going to give me three statements. Two yeah. will be true. Yeah. One will be a lie. And I'm going to try to guess the lie. Here we go. All right. Well, I picked these from the quarantine time as far okay. as what, what have I been doing during quarantine? Because besides, you know, our jobs, right. I've had to have something to keep my sanity. So one was, um, I've always really wanted to master a second language. And so I used the Duolingo app and I have felt to the point that I'm comfortable now with mastering a second language. Okay. So that's one thing I've spent my time doing. Uh, the second is I love tabletop board games. And so I designed my own, I created my own tabletop okay. board game during this time. And lastly, you know, so many people are doing things in the kitchen and cooking and things like that. I decided to learn about kombucha and I've been brewing kombucha. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Now I do, I, I do know that you have a love for tabletop board games and I know that you've shared some pretty awesome board game versions of Google, you know, in Google slides and things like that too. So I'm going to believe that that one's true. I think, I think that you're being tricky with a language. I think you learned a new language and it was JavaScript and <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> another, another bad tech joke there. Um, and kombucha. I think, I think the lie is a language. I don't think you learned a new language. You are correct. That is the lie. I mean, now it is true that Ich bin ein Mann, but <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I know like, you know, two phrases in German and then in French, <laughs> I can say, you know, j'ai un crayon rouge. I have a red pencil and I don't think that's going to help me too much. Um, so no, I did not learn and I did not apply myself to a new language, but yeah, I, I did. Really Create a create a board game, and I did uh, learn to brew kombucha. Are you? Uh, did you ever watch Parks and Recreation by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> yes, did you Did you create the cones, cones of Dunshire? <laughs> it's all about the cones, man. <laughs> uh, no, the game I made. Uh, it's called Supernova, and it's nice. about it's 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 it's, it's it got some science in it. It's uh, it's a cool game where you're trying to add mass to stars to get them to supernova and give off higher level elements without putting on too much mass to make them go into black holes. And oh, it's cool! Kind of a neat competitive game where you're trying to harvest higher level elements from stars. Ah, that sounds cool. Yeah. I feel like you need to be playing Blue Kit, Eric. Have you played Blue Kit yet? No. Oh, oh no no no! You just, I don't know how to pronounce it. Yes. Blue, yeah, blue, kit, blue. Kit. That's how it's. Yeah, okay. Yes. yes, I do know what it is. I just don't talk to other humans, so <laughs> I never hear words spoken. I speak. I speak to houseplants. Uh, so, <laughs> right. 
Yes, I, I, I do play. I have played on that website <laughs> now that I know how it is pronounced. My kids love playing Blue Kit. We play, they play it almost every night. They've now started developing their own Blue Kit yeah. decks and they just play Blue Kit just for fun. But there are some strategy ones in there. And I feel like they should, that you should probably talk to the creators at Blue Kit and get, get Supernova turned into there a Blue Kit. <laughs> Eric, Eric Kurtz X Blue Kit, like a mashup there. Love it. <laughs> Okay, Eric, well, let's jump into some educational duct tape right now. So for those people who uh, who came here uh, for the talk about um, uh, prepared meals, not prepared meals, but fancy meals yeah. and the pronunciation of Blue Kit, um, I'm going to describe to them how, uh, how educational duct tape works because they might not be familiar with it. So educational duct tape is my goofy metaphor that educational technology is at its best when it's not the goal or focus of a lesson, but a tool we're using to solve a problem, meet a goal, address a need, much like duct tape is just a tool. We never set forth to use duct tape. We are using it to solve problems. Okay. So that's kind of the ed tech integration mindset I like to take to things. So on the show, we like to start off with a question that a teacher might have and then see what kinds of educational technologies we can come up with that'll solve those problems. So the question I have for you, and this is a, a perfect question for you because I've always respected uh, the kinds of visuals that you use in your work, like on your on your tweets and in your YouTube your YouTube video, um, whatever they call the like the the main image that you see before you start the video, yeah. the cover cover image or whatever, um, and the images on your blog posts. I love. Uh, clear, simple, appealing, you know, eye catching and good communication through them. And I also know it's kind of a piece in the book too. Um, the question is, how can I have my students show comprehension or thinking with visuals? So what are some ways that we could bring visuals into our practice using educational technology? Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's, <laughs> I, I do love your analogy of educational duct tape, uh, because the, uh, the intro to the, my book is I pose the question, uh, what all can you use a screwdriver for? Um, and it's that same thing. So I'm starting a podcast called Educational Screwdriver. <laughs> but it's the same concept is, and I'm right there with you. It's about saying, okay, so you've got a screwdriver and you can use it to put screws into wood. But what else can you do with it? You know, and you start thinking through all of the things we use. We can you know, pretend it's a microphone we're singing into. We can use it to, you know, chip off ice. We can use it to stir paint. We can do all this stuff. And I take that same sort of, you know, idea and apply it to technology. And to answer the question about how can students show their thinking, their comprehension, you know, with, with visuals, my go-to is always to say, what tools do we already have laying around? like a mm -hmm. screwdriver and right. how can we use them in new creative ways? Now there's, I mean, you've got wonderful new tools like blue kit and things like that. That's mm -hmm. phenomenal. And I'm always looking for you know new tools as well, but there's, there's the go-to of saying, okay, we've got the Google suite of tools. You know, mm -hmm. we've got drawings and slides and docs and sheets and yeah, they're awesome. You know, slides is a wonderful presentation tool and, and sheets, a spreadsheet tool and so forth. But what else are they? What else can they be used for? And so when I think along the lines of that question, how can students show their thinking with visuals? You know, I start thinking about something like Google Slides and I think about creative projects they can do. And it would be things like, you know, stop motion animation, something that I believe, you know, is near and dear to your heart <laughs> as well. Uh, things like, you know, creating choose your own adventure stories or creating online animated comic strips or, or making eBooks. All of those are giving students a chance to use visuals, to use pictures and bring them to life in the example of like a stop motion animation, um, or to tell a story with visuals, whether it's, you know, a branching Google slideshow with, you know, a choose your own adventure story, things like that. And of course, the same thing can be applied to all of the Google tools, you know, think about Google drawings and, um, you know, creating an interactive clickable image where, you know, they're clicking on it and it's jumping out to different resources. Or I think about um, Google docs using emojis, which are visual, mm -hmm. they're images. Sometimes we don't realize you can put emojis in docs. They're actually already in docs. If you go into the right. uh, tools menu to special characters, emojis are already there. Having students write with emojis to make a rebus story where you've got text and images mixed together, you know, or just something like Google Sheets. Uh, we think of it as a number crunching thing, but, you know, we can create pixel art 
We can use visuals and we can, you know, make a map or create a character or design a logo with that. All of those are the sort of things that come to mind with to me when I'm thinking about, okay, how can we use the tools we already have to get our kids creating and to have them show their understanding um, yeah. in a visual way. Now, that's a whole quick list of those. Any one of those, I'm absolutely happy to dive deeper into or chew on or talk more yeah. about how it works or why they're good or things like that. But that's what comes to my mind right away is you don't have to learn a new tool. We right. can just take what we've already got, to kind of look at it sideways and do something creative with it. Right. This, that's why I always have fun doing stop motion slides with with educators at a, at a conference or at a training or something like that is because they know how to add an image into Google Slides for the most part. They know how to add like a background right. color. They know how to type in the background sli- or in the slide. It's just me then taking them and, and showing them how to turn that into an animation. Right. And it's a familiar tool. Like, could you make something better in Scratch? Yeah, yeah almost certainly. Sure. Right. Could you make something better in um, doing has a has an iPad oh, yeah. uh, animation? Yeah. Thing? Can you make something better in there? Yeah, for sure. But it, it, it is nice in some situations to to have that choice as a comfortable one. And I think that I think that's a power that we have um, in schools is that we, we might have one teacher who goes, this is the tool that I'm familiar with and I'm I'm comfortable using this in new ways. And then maybe the teacher in the room next door is like, I'm going to try out this new tool. And then their, sure. their students are being exposed to all of these things. Right. And it, it creates this rich experience for the kids. You know, absolutely. There is no right tool. Right. You know, it's right. it's what we're trying to accomplish, which is student learning, you know, collaboration, creativity, communication, those sort of things. It's just working backwards and finding the best tool to fit it. But like you said, sometimes how do you how do you help a teacher move, you know, into some new projects? Well, yeah. maybe it's building on something they already have a reasonable comfort level with and saying, right. okay, you don't have to learn a whole new tool. I loved you, what you said there. Yeah, I already know how to do slides, the basics. Right. Well, did you know if you add this one twist to it, you know, you know, or like with Google Drawings, you know, well, maybe they know how to do that. But do you know if you add a hyperlink on top of it, it becomes mm-hmm. clickable or Google Docs, did you know that mm-hmm. you can use the highlighter tool and highlight in black instead? And you can do like, you know, blackout poetry and, and things like that. You know, it's just taking a tool we already have a comfort level with and saying, ah, I can add that extra thing on top of that. And of course, it's also giving students choice. I I don't want to sit here and say, Mm -hmm. yes, everybody should have their students creating, you know, a choose your own adventure story in slides or something. But wouldn't it be great for it to be an option? Wouldn't it be great for the students to be able to say, oh, I can pick from these five or 10 things and find one that's a way that I like to express myself. Yeah. And those things, those things, then when they find those ways, first of all, they learn more about their themselves and their interests that they have and the things they might want to do more of in the future. But also they, they reach that flow, right? That state of flow that, that you were talking about when writing a blog post or when cooking one of those meals, the type of flow that I get when preparing a podcast or something like that, that I get when I'm doing stop motion slides, to be honest, too, to have students be able to find that flow in something that relates to their learning, right? So instead of creating a worksheet that feels like it takes them, like the minutes feel like hours, right? They're doing these things where the minutes feel like seconds, right? Right. Absolutely. You know, and when they have that choice, it's going to increase motivation because that's something they're excited about. They're going to do more than you ask them to do because they're having fun. And there's not as much friction. They're going to be able, to, you're going to get a better read on their understanding of the concept because you don't have a layer between the student and the expression of their understanding that's messing it up, that's right. fuzzying things up. Because if you told me, hey, Eric, I need you to explain photosynthesis and the way you need to do it is by performing a musical piece, mm-hmm. you know, I would be like, it's not going to be good. <laughs> Because my, I'm going to have to overcome this massive hurdle that right. I can't play an instrument, mm-hmm. you know, the concept of saying, well, you know, if it's a tool that the student doesn't feel comfortable with or engaged in, um, are they going to be able to really show their learning as clearly as if it was something they had a, a choice and also an excitement yeah. about? Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, too, because I think when a lot of teachers hear about choice boards, they're intimidated by the idea because they think, well, then I have to have some level of com- comfort with all of the tools that the kids are using, which, first of all, you don't. The kids have to develop that comfort. And I think your music example is a perfect example of that because 
I wouldn't be nervous having a student who's an experienced guitar player, let's say, uh, write and perform a song about something we're learning about in class. Even though I don't know how to play guitar, I don't have to worry about that part. I know the student has that. I can give them feedback on the content, right? So I don't have to know the tool, whether it's a guitar or Adobe Spark. I don't have to know it for that to work. And second of all, if they're doing these kinds of projects, like you named five different things that use Google Slides. The teacher could go like, I'm comfortable with Google Slides. And then the kids can do the stop motion slides or the choose your own adventure or the eBooks or the animations or the clickable images. And then the teacher is going to know that they have some level of comfort with what they're all doing. Right. But yet Mm -hmm. the kids are all getting to kind of express themselves in a way that feels more natural to them. And is going to bring out their um, their passion for for the content and and give us a better um, assessment of their their true understanding. Right. Yeah, and, and I get it. It is a little scary as a teacher to say, okay, I haven't mastered this, mm-hmm. but that's, that's okay. That's, that's okay. We don't have to. Well, I guess the first thing I should say is it's not that we don't have to. You can't. You, mm-hmm. We have to give that up. There are right. too many tools. You will, you can't, and we need to do our due diligence. We, we need to try to learn and grow, but it's not possible. I mean, we can't possibly be a master of all those things. There's always new tools and new twists. It's okay to let the students run with those things. Mm-hmm. And think about this too. You know, if you say, okay, everybody's going to do the same project. Okay. That, that's, that's fine. But you're now going to be grading, you know, 125 projects that are pretty much the same thing, just, you know, a little variation on it. If the students have choice in that, now we're getting all of these different learning objects that can be right. reused because now here's this kid who just gets crazy about, you know, stop motion animation and they make this amazing thing or they get crazy about clickable Google images and, and they make this amazing interactive thing. Well, guess what? Instead of you just grading that and, you know, turning it back and story's over, you can say, hey, can I can I share this next year? Can I use this? Now right. this is a teaching tool that you can use with your students the following year. And right. so it's not just looking at the assignment as something that has an end where, okay, I right. grade it. I give it back to you. It's over and done. No, some of the really awesome things the students are creating can now be used and reused in the future. Yeah. I think about all of the different levels of wins that happen in that situation, right? The, the kid wins in the fact that they maybe learned a new skill. The kid wins in the fact that they had fun in school. You win because you enjoyed looking at student work for once. Yes. Uh, you win because you develop some, some new content to use the next year. And the student wins in feeling honored that the teacher wants to use that, that piece of work right. of theirs in the future, right? So there, there's yes. multiple levels of why this is awesome. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, so tell us about, I think everybody kind of gets the idea of, of what stop motion slides is. Will you, will you give us a, a peek into what choose your own adventure slides are? Well, yeah. I mean, so you can do branching in a lot of different technologies. I use slides as an example. This also works in Google Docs. You, you can do it there as well. Uh, you can do it in Google Forms. You can do it with Google Sites. There's a lot of tools that will let you do this. Um, slides is definitely a good option for that. And really what it comes down to is just the fact that one of the things you're allowed to insert into a slide is a hyperlink, which I'm sure everybody goes, you know, like we said, every, oh, we, I know that. Of course, I can put a link and say, this goes to, you know, google.com or whatever. But the the twist, the only thing you need to add, because it's always just, well, what's that one little twist? You just need to realize you're actually allowed to link to other slides. You don't Mm -hmm. have to link to a website. When you put a hyperlink into a Google Slideshow, you can, you know, click below the box where the hyperlink goes. And there's a drop down menu that says slides in this presentation. And you can say, if you click this jump to slide five, if you click this, jump to slide six. And this opens up things like choose your own adventure stories where the students can write a story and include, you know, images to go along with it. Then as you read the story and you click on the choices, it jumps you to different slides. It's also great for choice boards or Mm -hmm. Jeopardy games or, you know, self-creating review quizzes. Um, And like I said, can be applied in other tools. It's a little different in docs. In docs, you can put in hyperlinks, of course, but to link internally, you have to, you have to link to 
headings. Mm -hmm. So you have to add what are called headings, which is no big deal. You're just highlighting something at the top of the page and you're formatting it as a heading rather than normal text. But it's the same idea. You can do internal linking, which then gives you this really neat branching option and opens up a lot more interactivity in these tools. It'd be kind of neat too to use it almost for like a differentiation activity, like like in a like a math class because we're both we're both former math teachers. Um, you know, maybe putting an equation on a slide and then saying, "Do you think the answer is x equals three or x equals or whatever?" A common mistake would be x equals four. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's say. And then if they click the wrong answer, maybe they get to something remedial and then come back and fix it. They get the right answer, maybe they move on to the next question. That'd be kind of interesting way to. The kids would have less fun with that, but <laughs> well, no, but see, that is that is exactly one of the examples. That, that I have on, on the blog and in the book is exactly that it is, you know, a self grading quiz where you've got a question and the answers when you click on it doesn't just say you're wrong. But when you click an answer, it goes to a slide that specifically addresses why that's not the right answer. Uh, now, keep in mind, I know we keep saying things like, you know, we can create these and our students can do these. But that can also be a student project. You know, it could yeah. be one option. Well, okay, you you can you can create a self grading interactive quiz using Google Slides for this chapter or for this unit. And think about the level the student needs to go through. They got to figure out what content's important. They got to know what's the right answer. But then they have to be able to think through what are some common wrong answers and why are those wrong? Right. You right. know, so a student could use this, could even do this as a project, which again, you can use and reuse for years to come. Yeah, that's great. And then that becomes an, a neat little kind of self-assessment tool that you can post for other kids to go through and just like test their right. own ideas as they go through it. Wow. Right. Yeah, that's some great ideas there, Eric. Support for this episode comes from, well, it's actually from me, or kind of. I actually just want to take this opportunity to tell you about my favorite company to get custom stickers from. I've tried a handful of companies over the years, and I've actually been pleased with all of them, but one company gets A pluses across the board. Sticker quality, prices, deals, customer service, shipping speed, sense of humor of their advertising, everything. They're just great. And that company is Sticker Mule. And they do more than just stickers. Seriously, I have educational duct tape pins, keychains, packing envelopes, packing tape, and they've got other things available too even their own Sticker Mule brand hot sauce. So if you've got some sticker needs, head to jakemiller.net slash Sticker Mule, that's S-T-I-C-K-E-R-M-U-L-E, to order some stickers. And if this is your first time ordering, you'll get $10 off just by using that link. And full disclosure, I'll get $10 credit, which I'll actually probably use for some hot sauce. Yeah, I think I need some. That's jakemiller.net slash sticker mule. So I normally, when people say they want to make visuals uh, in, in the classroom, I normally go to the Google tools like you do too. Cause I say like you could, you could assign them in Google classroom. You can collect them in Google classroom. Uh, your kids already have access to it. Your kids already know how to use it. And so I've, I've been, not as eager to jump to tools like like Adobe Spark or Canva or things like that, though I love them. I think sure. they make you like maybe they make amazing graphics and things like that. I haven't been as eager because of that flexibility. But recently, um, I've gotten pretty exciting um, excited about what Canva for Education offers um, with the new education program. Um, so for listeners that might not be familiar with it, you know, I, I started trying out Canva years ago and I said, well, this is really cool, but I feel like every time I find a template that I want to use and a font I want to use, um, the, the button, the, the buttons that I want to put in are paid buttons and the, yeah. the stock images that I want to put in are stock images and the, the size I want to put in is it like cost me money. And like, this is all like, this would be great if I had a membership, but I'm going to walk away and go use slides. But now the education version is free, free for educators, free for students. And so that kind of like got me interested. I was like, hmm, oh, that's yes. interesting. And what really sold me, have you seen kind of the, how you have like a classroom account in Canva? Have you seen this? I have not. Yeah. So you, I like in Canva, it's almost kind of like Google Classroom where I could assign my students an, a project in Canva, you know, if they have accounts, which obviously for most educators is going to go through some district approval kind of stuff. But if they have accounts, you can assign it in Canva, assign even a template in Canva and then collect it in Canva. And it kind of operates almost like its own little Google Classroom, which if you're if you're in a situation where you might use it regularly, mm-hmm. 
I think could bring in a lot of power into your classroom. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I have not, I think I'm in the same spot you described in the past. I've yeah. you know used Canva. I've created some graphics with it, but it's been, you know, it's been a while ago because right. yeah, I ran up against the paid features as well. Um, I do remember the information about the you know educator option, right. but I just, it's one of the things I have not dived into and yeah. that's a good encouragement to do yeah. that. Yeah, me too. I, I've got, I've got to go play with it. So you could add in, um, you know, different kinds of graphs and they, they have like bar graphs and data tables and pie graphs kind of built into the tool. And you can add in GIFs and videos and emojis. Uh, it's something I still have to play with, but the thing that excites me is that ability to assign and collect and view work and comment on work right in there. I think maybe for a one-off project, I probably yeah. wouldn't, be eager to use it because we don't want to go like start and start up a new tool just for one project, but it might be a beginning of the year. Let's try this out and see if it works and, and run with it throughout the year uh, in their yeah. kind of cool option. Well, I'm going to have to revisit Canva because like you, I yeah. do every graphic <laughs> in drawings and slides. And yeah. if you see something on my blog, if you, I mean, that's all my templates like, um, uh, the backgammon template template yeah. that I did recently, and I've got one that I I just need to post it. Um, it's the Royal Game of Ur. Uh, Donnie Piercy was telling me about this. Okay. He said, "Oh, you really need to look into this Royal Game of Ur. It's this several thousand year old game, and it's an awesome game. There's some amazing videos um, about how we discovered it and learned about it, and I created a template for that as well. But everything in it is complete." completely created with nothing but the tools inside of drawings and slides. And so, uh, you know, you can be so, so creative using those shapes and using layers and ordering things and using the crop to shape. There's so much cool stuff you can do, but maybe I do need to step outside of just those tools. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I don't know. I don't know. You're well. amazing stuff with it. I, I think, I think the stuff you make looks great. And like you said, those, those board games, they come out so like impressive that it's hard to believe they were made in there. And I think it shows the power of just those simple tools that we already have available to us. And I think to, to, to an educator, you, you kind of, and this is the message I try to say to educators all the time is you don't have to choose something new. You can like, you could, you could see what, what's possible in another tool and go, let me see if I could do something like that in something that I'm comfortable with. Right. Because uh, certainly over this last year, uh, us as educators, we've been doing so many new uncomfortable things that maybe yeah. we could just stick with slides and drawings. <laughs> and dogs, right? <laughs> yeah. And also it is, you know, it's a matter also of budgets. You know, yeah. I think absolute companies should be supported. If they create a tool and yep. they've got, you know, a paid version and a free version, more power to them. That's, that's fantastic, you know, but I, I support 35 school districts in my, in my day job and they've all have, you know, different financial abilities and, and budgets and needs. And, and so as much as I love to promote, you know, new tools, mm -hmm. it's always in the back of my mind. Is there a free version of it? Is there right. at least something that if, if my schools can't afford it, there is right. still value here. And for those that can go deeper, great. So yeah, yeah that's one of the reasons I fall back on the Google suite a lot. Right. Well, and when you, when, when your goal, if your goal is enriching learning experiences and getting into your student, peeking into your student's head, so to speak, with these visuals, like finding a new way to tap into their understanding and get, and get a picture of it. And you could do that in Google Slides or Google Drawings. That's certainly a, a fantastic option for them to use, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, I always say it's nice too with those kinds of tools because your school has already, um, agreed to the the privacy policy and the terms of service and stuff like that you know when when you know a, a comparable when when another tool is comparable but requires a new agreement you know sure then in, in some of those situations sometimes it makes sense to stick with the one we're already using but it's uh, nice to have options too it sure is I, I feel like i'm being very indecisive now eric <laughs> but i don't i don't know why i'm worried about it because we never come to a decision that's the point we we just say these are some choices that are out there that's right do what do what suits you and in your classroom that's right. Yeah. Well, I, so I'm excited to to compose these these show notes, Eric, because normally when I uh, prepare the show notes for an episode, I have to like track things down to put links to things in it. But I I know that on the Control Alt Achieve website, 
there is stop motion slides and choose oh, your yeah. own adventure and oh, yeah. book and oh, yeah. image, they're all there oh, yeah. so i know i'm going to find all those links easy and then i'm just going to link to the amazon link to your book because i know so many of them are also featured in there too uh and i, th- I think anybody who goes out and grabs it's going to really enjoy it because like oh, i said it, it's it's fantastic absolutely i appreciate that and you know it's one of those things where um you know it's meeting people where they're at. Some folks yeah. like to read a blog post. Some prefer to listen to a podcast. Some want to watch a YouTube video. Some people want to hold a book in their hand. Yeah. And just like our students, you know, we as educators, we have our comfort levels where how we learn best. And so I'm happy to be able to provide it in a format that um, may cross over and reach some other people that yeah. maybe the blog wouldn't have. Yeah. Well, we appreciate all the content that you've been providing in the podcasts and in the blogs and in the videos and in the YouTubes and in the GEG Ohio. I should mention, I should, I should throw out there GEG Ohio. If you're a Google yeah. educator, uh, Eric and Stephanie Howell host the GEG Ohio every month or so. And it's yep. a fantastic, I, I listen to the podcast version, so I have to picture what you're clicking on sometimes, Eric. <laughs> 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 but, yeah. but otherwise it's up there on YouTube and, and the book and lots of uh, great resources. And we really appreciate you doing all that stuff for educators. You've been so, uh, I, the, the support that educators have gotten from you over the years with Google has been, uh, has been huge. And I, I the, for, for the other educators out there, thank you, Eric. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm glad to hear that in the end, you know, what makes me so happy is, you know, when I'll see somebody tweet something showing um, a project the students did, yeah. you know, they'll be like, oh, here's what our students did today using, you know, pixel art or build a snowman or something. And I know some kids, you know, either went home or they were at home doing this project and they got to do something different. They got yeah. to do something fun. They got to do something engaging and that, you know, it, and you know, that's the ultimate goal is to make it through to the students at the end. So if people do stuff, please, please do uh, share those things with me. I love to see that if you tag me in them or email and, and, and let me know what your students have done. That's a big encouragement. Yeah. Well, there, listeners, you've got your homework assignments now. So you got to send Eric pictures of stop motion slides or choose your own adventures or Rebus stories or blackout poetry uh, or pixel art that your kids have made, or maybe a picture of them playing. What was it? The ancient city of Ur or what was it? Royal, the Royal Game of Ur. I'll, I'll get it posted. I'll, I'll get, get it posted. posted. I guess that's my goal is try to get it posted before the podcast. Comes that's out. your goal, Eric. That's I'll, everybody my responsibility. Of sending pictures and things like that. <laughs> Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on tonight. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. And thank you for all you do. It is so, so appreciated. Thank you, Eric. I can't believe it took me so long to get Eric on the show, but I am so glad that I finally did. I hope that you enjoyed that discussion, and I hope that you'll go follow Eric. Who am I kidding? You probably already do. uh, And consider checking out his book. To review a bit of what we talked about today, Eric shared a great analogy about screwdrivers and (laughs) low-key a good jab with his educational screwdriver podcast. (laughs) But anyhow, I love how he was saying that screwdrivers can be used for lots of things, and we have them hand and convenient and know how to use them and can repurpose them in multiple different ways. Though I would prefer the vodka and orange juice screwdrivers myself, Eric, but oh, well, I digress. <laughs> Let's see. What else did Eric and I talk about? I loved his focus on using familiar tools to solve new problems, as he alluded to with the screwdriver metaphor. Uh, he talked about Google Slides for stop motion animation and choose your own adventure activities. We also talked about doing that branching in docs or forms as well to create those uh, choose your own adventure activities uh, and about how you can use it for differentiation or self-grading activities. Uh, He shared about some ideas for Google Docs, including blackout poetry and rebus stories with emoji. And finally, he shared about using Google Sheets for pixel art. I also threw in Canva for education and Adobe Spark for education, which I'll put links to both of those in there. And actually, I'll put links to all of Eric's blog posts relating to all of those topics in the show notes as well. Uh, but Canva for Education and o- Adobe Spark for Education, two great tools for visuals. And Eric and I talked about how, you know, it's, 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 there's not one right tool. There might be one tool that's just right for you. That doesn't mean you should use 
any specific thing that we listed, you use the one that fits best for you and your content and your students, whatever screwdriver is best for you. It might be Phillips head, might be flathead, might be orange juice and vodka. <laughs> we also talked about Eric's Royal Game of Ur template, which he did finish a day or two after the interview, because of course he did, because he's Eric Kurtz uh, and sent me the link to it. And that is in the show notes as well. Also, we met, talked about Eric's phenomenal book. It's titled Control Alt Achieve, Rebooting Your Classroom with Creative Google projects. And finally, we talked about uh, one of my favorite places to learn about changes in Google edu- Google for Education's offerings, which is GEG Ohio, uh, which Eric co-hosts along with Stephanie Howell. They do a great work in there. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So lots of good stuff. As always, all of those details, all of those links are in the show notes. Uh, but last, certainly not least, it is time for my favorite part of the show, which is the celebration of the adjacent possible. As I mentioned earlier, adjacent possible is the idea that whatever you do, whatever you try, whoever you talk to, whoever you listen to, wherever you go, opens you up to new adjacent possibilities. And the connections and discussions between me and you and you and you, between duct tapers, between educators, those open up our adjacent possibilities. So first up, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, I've got a speak pipe message from Carmen Tatum to share. I love this idea and Carmen's excitement about it. It's really cool how she says, like, I didn't expect this to have the big effect it did, but my kids loved it. It's, it's fun how we try things out and we discover new and exciting things in our classrooms that way. Just a note before I play it, since I'm on the free version of speak pipe, I'm limited to a certain number of seconds per recording. Uh, and so you'll hear Carmen get cut off towards the end. I think she only had a couple more seconds to go anyhow uh, but you'll get the gist of it and I'll, I'll kind of summarize at the end but anyhow take it away Carmen hi Jake this is Carmen Tatum and I'm a fifth grade teacher in California I continue to enjoy listening to your podcast and I really enjoyed your last episode with Dr. Natasha Rachel and how she discussed increasing engagement and learning for our students I wanted to share something that I've done with my fifth grade students that have actually gotten them excited about taking tests. Um, Our school does use Google for Education and Google Classroom. And early on, I created a Genius Hour classroom for the students so that if they had extra time and wanted to work on something else, they had other activities to do, such as shapegrams, comic strip templates, and so on. However, I was really surprised on what the most popular activity is, and I wanted to tell you more about that. This activity was to create a header or a banner for Google Forms. I created a template in Google Drawings for the exact size and shape that could be uploaded to Google Forms, and I gave them a brief tutorial on how to make their own design with backgrounds, importing images, and working with the different layers. I then would use their design for my header for my Google Quiz. It was crazy how they were practically begging me to create more tests so that they could see their design being used. It really made my heart sing. So um, since I use this in Google Classroom, I could just go to my Google Classroom folder and find any recent creations and simply download the image and up. I promise I didn't cut Carmen off there. That was speak pipe that cut her off. But as she was saying, you could tell she was a couple seconds from the end, but it was cool how the students were submitting those um, images in Google Classroom, which gave her easy access to them. And as she was saying, she downloaded them and then she uploaded them into her form uh, as that header image. And I love that it got her kiddos creating, but also makes them feel some pride and some ownership over what's happening in the classroom. And as Eric and I kind of alluded to today, uh, it opened them up to some choice uh, and gave them something they were excited about doing. So that's a really cool idea, Carmen. I love the idea of kind of having that genius hour Google Classroom, giving the students some options for things they could do, giving them some things that are creative and maybe up their tech skills. And that came out really cool. So I'm glad she shared that. Finally, today's question came to me from Corey Colby on Twitter. Let's check out his question and then I'll share a bunch of answers. Uh, Take it away, Immersive Reader Chrome extension. There was a gadget in Google Docs that allowed creating flashcards. I cannot find it now. Anyone have any suggestions for the best way I can do that? I need to create flashcards that include images, but don't want to pay for Quizlet. So a bunch of options here, Corey. Uh, Quizlet is great, but as you pointed out, images are part of the paid version of Quizlet. And I do feel like it makes sense to pay for or 
preferably ask your school to pay for tools that benefit your classroom. But I get the need to limit the number of paid tools we're using. It, it drives me a little bit crazy when people say, oh, it's only $4 a month or whatever, you should pay for it. But if you say that about GimKit and Quizlet and Kahoot and all these other tools, all of a sudden you're paying $40 a month or something like that. And there's got to be some limitations. And you know it, it shouldn't be coming out of your pocket. And oftentimes the school is just not going to pay for that much stuff for you. So I understand the issue. And sometimes we have to find free ways to do these things we need to do. So my first thought was Google Slides flashcards. They're easy. They're collaborative. Uh, You could easily add visuals and as many visuals as you want. And when I've had students do it before, I've had them put the word on one slide and then the definition or the picture or whatever on the second slide. Now, the downside of that is means they're not randomized. uh, So you can't, you know, if you shuffle it, then they'll be separated from what they what they go with. So they'll always be in the same order. So the alternative then is to put the word and the picture or definition or whatever on the same slide and use animation so that one thing is there first and then after a click, the next thing appears. And then you can actually use a uh, slides add-on called Slides Randomizer to randomize those slides and put them whatever whatever order you want. And actually in the tweet thread, I think it was Corey actually found a video from, I believe it was Julie Smith, the uh, techie teacher uh, is her uh, online handle uh, about how she uses Slides Randomizer. And it's a great video if you're interested in doing that. So that's an option. Uh, The other thing I suggested to Corey was the Pear Deck Flashcard Factory. I absolutely love this process. Students come up with their own definitions and make their own drawings and then the class decides which ones to approve and then it creates set of flashcards, which you can actually, I think, export and import into Quizlet. I'm not sure if it'll, is it Quizlet that it works in? I'm not sure on that note. Um, But you can also export them as a PDF and potentially cut them out and print them. But it doesn't have like its own built-in way of using them as flashcards. That might be uh, a tripping point there. Uh, Amy Storer, who's another uh, awesome ed tech um, consultant or speaker or specialist out there uh, mentioned the Adobe Spark flashcard maker, which I had not heard of. So I checked it out. It looks like it's just a template where each slide uh, each post is one flashcard, like a single-sided flashcard. So if you wanted a te- set of 10 flashcards, you'd have to have 10 separate projects. And if they were two-sided, you'd have to have 20 separate projects. And unless I'm misunderstanding that, if I am, somebody fill me in on that. They would look great because Adobe Spark is awesome uh, for making great-looking stuff. I don't know that it would be a efficient way of doing this. Uh, at Mrs. Wambold shared, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, so I apologize I'm not. She said, there's a Google Sheets add-on, but I can't remember what it is right now. And that that got me thinking. I said, I think I know what she's talking about. And we're gonna get to it in a second. Uh, And then she also mentioned the Desmos card sort, uh, which you make a bunch of cards, and you kind of sort them into piles. So not exactly flashcards, but really great activity that could potentially work here. Uh, And then Darcy Priester, who's at Miss Priester underscore ITRT, and at EdTech Sarah 67, and at WV Nomads, all mentioned flippity.net, which is what Mrs. Wambold was talking about. That was the Google Sheets add on that she was mentioning. So, Flippity is free. You build the content in Google Sheets, and Flippity provides the templates for it. And then you go to Flippity to publish it through a Flippity site. And then the students can go to that link and interact with the image, with the, um, flashcards right there online, which is kind of the important part that I think Corey was looking for. Uh, You can add images if the images are online, so they have to be posted somewhere to add a URL for them. You could even embed videos and audio and equatio equations. They're not like super easy to add them, but it looks doable for anybody who's listening to a podcast. I think you can handle it. You got it. Um, But it's not maybe as user-friendly as maybe the paid version of Quizlet is. I'm I'm not sure. I'd have to try them out to see. Um, a couple other suggestions at Wilmot Jason suggested Canva flashcards. Um, it looks to be a little bit better than the Adobe Spark offering because it looks like they're pages of flashcards, like a two by four grid, but you still can't interact with them digitally. As far as I could tell, you'd have to print them and use them, but maybe a little bit more convenient to do than the Adobe Spark version and still also nice looking. Uh, and then at PNW Bosey's, uh, underscore EdTech shared wordwall.net. I'm not familiar with wordwall. I poked around a little bit and they do have what looks like a flashcard option in there, but I have not explored that one yet. Um, As always, if you have additional options or answers or things to share or thoughts on this, I will put a link to Corey's 
original tweet in the show notes. You can go there. You can see the links to the things that people shared, the video that uh, the Julie Smith uh, provided that was shared in there, uh, or respond with additional options. You can also do that by reaching out to me. And if you've got a question that you would like to air and if, or have answered in a future episode, you could tweet it to me at Jake Miller Tech. You could email it to me at Jake Miller Tech at gmail.com. You could submit it on the show's Flipgrid at flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape or submit a message on my SpeakPipe page at speakpipe.com slash edu duct tape. All of those options are available to you. And a reminder, uh, the next person who uses SpeakPipe, Carmen was first. The second person is going to win a, uh, a bunch of swag as Carmen is too. And finally, here's your homework for this week. Find an educator who loves tabletop board games, like today's guest, Eric Kurtz, and tell them about the show. No, Eric won't be sending them a free copy of his new game, Supernova, and I'm not getting them a signed game of uh, The Cones of Dunshire from Ben Wyatt. (laughs) But I think that whoever this educator is who loves tabletop board games, I think they will also enjoy listening to this show. So go find them and tell them about it. That is your homework for tonight, and you will get a zero if you don't do it before the next episode. So find that educator and tell them about educational duct tape. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so that does it for today's episode. As always, check the show notes for details about signing up for my newsletter, joining the Duct Tapers Facebook group, inquiring about having me speak at an upcoming event, getting some podcast stickers, and more. And don't forget to do your homework. <laughs> as always, as a parent, I'm grateful for the work you do. And as an educator, I'm proud of your dedication to lifelong learning. See you guys in a fortnight. Thank you for listening to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Please visit eduducttape.com to join the discussion, share possible topics, inquire about being a guest, or contact Jake. And remember, duct is spelled with a T, not a quack quack cake.